So, as promised, we're going to look at not just Psalm 145, but several of the acrostic psalms. And if that sounds like really boring to you, actually I think it's really exciting. And it's one thing I really enjoy and have enjoyed even more about uh, lately about studying God's Word. Because now it's kind of my job. And uh, I've been very blessed in a church, you know, to grow up in a church that is serious about studying God's Word and applying it uh, to our lives. And uh, privileged to go to a private Christian school where I had a Bible class every single day. It was a requirement to graduate. And, uh, and then somewhere, I don't know where the, I guess I always have been a curious kid, and um, I know I almost drove my dad insane, because um, on road trips, I would read everything, any traffic sign, didn't matter what it was, and it, um, I think it might have annoyed him. <laughs> there were some subtle, oh, I don't know, there was some subtle body language going on and some not so subtle verbal language going on, like, shut up, please, for the love of all that's good and holy, stop talking. So, anyway. Uh, but I just, I love to read, I love to study, and it's just awesome. I get to spend my time doing this. And uh, so I've read the 145th Psalm many times. It kind of, as I mentioned, popped in my head when I did that little devotional uh, on Friday, and I thought, man, this is, I, I, what I noticed as I was reading it in the ESV is that in bracket, there was, there was a bracketed, portion of scripture after verse 13, and I read the footnote, and it, it said, oh, well, verse 13 doesn't show up in some documents, and so I thought, what? Is this a missing verse? And so as I dug into that more, uh, I became challenged to, uh, well, see what that was all about, because not, there's not agreement in whether that verse belongs there but guess what? Psalm 145 is not alone. It has several cousins and brothers and sisters in the Psalms. There are actually nine acrostic Psalms. There they are. Psalm 9 and 10, which actually in the Septuagint and other uh, manuscripts, they're combined as one Psalm. And it, makes, it actually makes sense that they belong together because Psalm 10 does not have an author ascribed to it. Psalm 9 does. It's a Psalm of David's. But then it, it doesn't make sense that they go together, but there's nothing mentioned in Psalm 10. Does that make sense? So it's like, yeah, you know what? These, these probably do go together. Don't know why they were ever separated. Um, there's 38 verses between the two of them. And, uh, and if you're not sure what we're talking about with the word acrostic, well, basically, in this case, it's where they use the Hebrew letters of the, alf the, letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 letters in the primary Hebrew alphabet. And so what they did here is that uh, each stanza or group of verses begins with one of those letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's a literary device, and David used it a lot. Um, so before we dig into that any further, let's go ahead and have a moment of silent prayer, and then uh, we'll just go crazy on acrostic psalms. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word, and thank you that we can dig into it. And it's not that we're, we're not un uncovering any special revelation. It's already been revealed uh, to us by you, by your Holy Spirit. But God, you are a creative God, and you leave these little gems that are, they're hidden, but they're, they're there if we make the effort to dig into them. And so, God, thank you for giving us joy in your word, joy in studying your word. And Lord, help it to not be just a, a clever language exercise or grammar exercise or a poetic journey, but help it to inspire us to apply your word to our lives. Why did you use these literary devices in your word? And what does that mean for us? So God, thank you for 
your creativity, for your love and mercy, and ultimately for your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray these things. Amen. All right, so as you can see, uh, Psalm 25 is another one of the acrostic psalms. Psalms 25 and 34 follow a pretty standard format in that there's 22 verses and each of them line up with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So no real mystery there. Psalm 37 has 40 verses, and if you can do the math, that's more than 22. Um, so that's where it stanzas. And then Psalm 111 uh, actually only has uh, 10 verses, but uh, each line in, its, uh, in that particular psalm lines up with a letter. Now, some of these don't line up perfectly, and that annoys people. Um, it annoys people like me who want things to be perfect. Um, Psalm 112 also has 10 verses. They're the two shortest acrostic psalms. And no, they're not, they don't go together. They're not, they're, they are two separate ones, but it follows a similar format. Now, Psalm 119 and 145, they're the last two. They happen to be the ones we know the best because Psalm 119, wow, what a psalm. 176 verses. And it, instead of doing, uh, if you do the math, it does it in groups of eight for each letter. And each verse, though, within the group of eight starts with that Hebrew letter. So the first Hebrew letter is Aleph, and Aleph uh, starts each line in that group of eight, in that stanza, which I think is kind of, kind of cool, kind of fascinating. Now, maybe you've done this uh, in a writing assignment or exercise or just uh, for your own pleasure. Have you ever done an, an acrostic like with your name and then you put like different uh, characteristics like with Diana? Um, I'm going to let her husband pick it. <laughs> Delightful. Delightful, ingenious, amorous. <laughs> wow, wow. He stopped with amorous. Um, <laughs> You know, so some people have done that. It's kind of a cool thing to do. If you have a really long name, it could be an effort. But um, anyway, so um, Psalm 119, obviously very long. And then, of course, Psalm 145. Does it have 21 verses or does it have 22? If you look in your Bible, it most likely is going to say 21 verses. But depending on which translation... Um, it's going to have some sort of footnote. Um, or if you have King James, for example, it's not going to include it at all. Um, but something happened post-King James, and we mentioned it this morning, and that's when the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered. It was not the first document or manuscript to show a potential 22nd verse, um, but it sort of did, it did have an influence. So New American Standard, NIV, New Living Translation, ESV, have all either included it or uh, in the ESV's case, and I happen to be partial to the ESV, they put it in brackets. So it's very clear that they're dubious as to whether it belongs there or not. The other translations put it in there and then there's a, a footnote. In fact, I'm speaking ahead of my notes here, uh, so I'll, we'll get to that a little bit more later. There are other passages of Scripture that are acrostics. Uh, so, uh, Proverbs 31, rather, verses 10 through 31 is an acrostic. Lamentations. Now, we sing one of the great hymns, Great is Thy Faithfulness, out of chapter 3 of Lamentations, and that's part of a really cool acrostic. Nahum, verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. So, again, there's a dozen of these acrostic passages in Scripture, but the Psalms uh, take up the bulk of them. And out of those Psalms, uh, 10 of those are uh, ascribed to David. So David liked using this particular literary device. So for those of you who have memorized the Hebrew alphabet, or in Hebrew, they use the first two letters and call it an alphabet. Makes sense, right? Um, there it is. Do note that Hebrew, it's not backwards. It's an older language than ours, so we'll have to say we're backwards. But note that their alphabet starts there. It reads from right to left. So there you see there, basically, their A, B, C, if you will. Um, note some of the names, if you have it. They're, and note the Greek alphabet, how some of these names are pretty darn close. Think of Aleph and Alpha. Um, so let's dig into Psalm 119 a little bit. 
and uh, find out a few things. First of all, Psalm 119, uh, we don't know who the author was, the human author at least, uh, with any particular certainty. Um, but we do know that they were rather verbose. <laughs> they liked to write. But it is a fascinating psalm, and it's fascinating what you find in it. The Hebrew word Yahweh is found two dozen times uh, throughout those verses. And if you read Psalm 119, almost every verse has a version of the word. It might say, God's ways, his statutes, his precepts, his testimonies, you know, so it's something to do with God's word and the importance of it. You'll also find the word God, Lord, or an appropriate pronoun in almost every verse as well. So you can tell that the psalmist is very interested in us knowing God's word and knowing who God is. Now, what's interesting about the stanzas in Psalm 119 is that they follow a general pattern. Not always, but they do follow uh, this kind of a theme. The first and fifth verses of the stanza of eight, am I losing anybody here? <laughs> so you've got your eight verses, verse one and verse five. Typically, verse one gives the theme and verse five repeats the theme. Um, after verses 1 and after verses 5, you have kind of, uh, you'll see some sort of opposition, conflict, affliction that the psalmist uh, speaks of. And then verse 8, the last verse in the stanza is kind of a transition verse. And it gives us kind of a, well, transition into the theme of the following stanza. I'll give you an example from the very beginning, the first eight verses of Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose way, notice that word popping up, right? Is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. So you can already see in those first four verses, a reference to God and his word. In, in several different ways. Um, what would you say is the theme based on verse one? You're blessed if you do what? Yeah, follow God's ways. You walk in his law, right? Um, so it's, does it follow the pattern and is repeated in verse five? Oh, that my ways be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Yeah, you see a similar theme. Um, obey God, do what he tells you to do, follow his laws. Um, let me back up and see, do we find any kind of conflict, opposition, affliction in verses two, three, and four? Blessed are those who keep his testimonies and seek him with their whole heart, not so much there, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. So we don't really see it in there, but check out verse six. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. So we kind of see, maybe not uh, in, in a negative sense, but sort of a, a reverse way. He says, look, if I'm not doing these things, then I will be put to shame. I will um, not have an upright heart. And then verse 8, the end of the stanza, I will keep your statutes, do not utterly forsake me. And then it goes into verse 9, right? We're setting it up, setting up the theme. How can a young man keep his way pure? And you guys know this verse, by guarding it according to your word. Or I, I stumble on that translation because I'm used to, you know, more of a New King James or King James, you know, your word have I hid in my heart type of thing, um, which we see uh, coming up here in verse uh, 11. But uh, so we see the theme there. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so it just, it just, it's really a beautiful poem. Um, and it's just awesome to see how David, or excuse me, whoever the psalmist is in this particular case, is inspired by the Holy Spirit and just how it flows amazingly. I'll keep your statutes when I obey you, uh, don't forsake me, and then goes right into, okay, I know how, I know how to be successful in the Christian walk. Um, do what you tell me to do. <laughs> walk in your word. Um, yeah. So 
what you might notice, if you have a King James Version, and several versions do this, it, it puts the, I know this is very tiny print, but it puts the uh, Hebrew letters, you'll see them in the front, front of each of those psalms, those sections there, uh, based on the letters. But you'll notice that the King James uses kind of some archaic spelling. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's very similar, Aleph versus, well, Aleph. Uh, but other times it's very different. Um, and uh, so more modern Hebrew speakers would use that, that right column there. One thing also that's unique about Psalm 119 is that a lot of it is used as part of the prayers in a Jewish ceremony. So with Rosh Hashanah and several others, these are part of, these, these are some of the scriptures that um, are recited. And uh, just to show you a picture, here's the beginning of Psalm 119 in the Hebrew. And it's not backwards, <laughs> but you can see how it reads. But, Remember what I said, each stanza begins with, so this is Aleph, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and there's the Aleph right there. See that bud, 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 right there? So notice it's there in every single verse in the Hebrew. It, they all begin with the same letter. Now, here's a really cool version of that psalm. And, uh, you know, I wrote down... PowerPoint does some weird things. Sometimes the notes that I put in here do not show up when we are projecting it, and that kind of annoys me, but I cannot do anything about it because I wrote down who uh, painted this, who did this uh, artwork. But anyway, that is, that is Psalm 119, verse 81, and this is how the artist portrayed that verse. I think it would be cool if we started doing stuff like this again. Do you remember uh, Timothy Botts? He did calligraphy, and he was really popular. Uh, some of you are looking like you kind of know what I'm... Okay, most of you think I've lost my mind. These are really separate issues. <laughs> I mean, let's be, let's be real. But another thing, um, any, in all seriousness, has anyone ever memorized Psalm 119? Do you know who did? William Wilberforce. Uh, if you're not familiar with William Wilberforce, go... Uh, See if you, I don't know if you can find it online. Or, I mean, I, I, actually, there's a copy in the um, church library of Amazing Grace. And um, it's an amazing movie, and it's the story of William Wilberforce. You also see John Newton, of course, the author of the uh, hymn Amazing Grace. But Wilberforce was a British politician. Uh, this is a guy who had prestige and power and, and wealth and, ba and basically gave everything to end the slave trade. And uh, it took him a long time to do it. Um, he probably could have been uh, prime minister. His buddy was William Pitt, who did become the youngest prime minister in the history of England. Uh, but Wilberforce uh, was not, he was a, he was pro-life in every way you can imagine. Think of what was going on in England. Not only did you have slaves being abused, human beings being abused, but they, were, they also were not treating animals well. And so, I mean, if you got tired of your horse, your horse made a mistake, you'd beat the thing, you know, to death. And it wasn't, nothing was really thought of that. And Wilberforce said, these are God's creatures. Um, no life is, you know, uh, worthless. But uh, this quote from Wilberforce, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. He felt that even if Britain didn't change based on what he said, they were accountable because he wanted them to know what the truth was. Remarkable guy. Uh, Eric Metaxas wrote an excellent biography on Wilberforce. It's pretty lengthy. Uh, if you are so inclined, it's well, well worth the read. His uh, biography of uh, Martin Luther is also uh, excellent. But Wilberforce memorized the 119th Psalm, and he would recite it out loud as he was walking to Parliament. It must have been a long walk. Um, <laughs> But uh, he was pretty amazing, a little bit eccentric. It wasn't unusual to come to his palatial mansion and find wild animals roaming about. Um, and um, although I don't think he was a vegetarian, so some of the animals wandered into the wrong part of the house. So Psalm 25, another one of the acrostic psalms. Um, 
The reason that we're going to take a peek at Psalm 25 is because this is another one where people struggle with, uh, it doesn't follow, well, let me back up just a little bit. The, the one of the reasons that people say Psalm 145 is missing a verse is simply because, again, there's 21 verses, but the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. Ergo, is that the right term? <laughs> Hence, <laughs> therefore, uh, it must be missing a letter. So we're using human logic to explain something that's divine. Doesn't always work, does it? But David did not always fit, and the psalmists did not always fit the same convention when it came to these acrostics. Yeah, they would stick to the 22 letters, but sometimes they did not. And in Psalm 25, they did not. In fact, um, unless they stuttered, you can, even, you can even see this in the English. <laughs> Some translations use the word look instead of consider. Um, but in the Hebrew, uh, the, the psalmist here uh, apparently screwed up because they use the same letter twice. But um, I, maybe I should have put up the, a little bit more for context, but I intentionally put a gap between those two verses. I don't know, your ESV, there's a gap between those two verses. And usually there's a gap because there's a new thought or paragraph, if you will. And that's what happened here. So the psalmist is using, again, a different literary device saying, uh, so that he can transition from, it's, it's really a pause. He wants you to think about what you've just read. You've just read 18 verses of this psalm, and he ends that section with, consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. And he takes a moment to reflect on that. And then he says, you know what? Let's use that same letter and let's change the theme. Consider, verse 19, how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. So it's a different thought. It's a different direction. And uh, I think it's just, I think it's just really cool. Maybe I'm the only one, but I just think it's awesome. So let's dig into Psalm 145. That's why you came here. You don't care about Psalm 25. You want the rock star Psalm here. Psalm 145. A song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall decree, excuse me, declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and will, I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. So that brings us through verse 13 and here's where, depending on your translation, you get something along these lines. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Verse 14, the Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So there's the 145th Psalm. Now, did you notice anything, did anything stand out to you about, uh, here's the, uh, I'm putting it as verse 14 question mark. <laughs> Because um, if it does belong there, it would have been the 14th verse. Do you notice anything about it? Um, did anything stand out to you about it? First of all, anything heretical about it? 
No, I mean, it's, it's, it's consistent, and that's one thing that's really important. When we look at like the apocryphal works, uh, which are found in most Roman Catholic Bibles, sometimes called the Deuterocanonical, which is hard to say. You might want to name your firstborn that. No? You can call, it, call them duty for short. No? I'll probably share that with you anyway. Um, but those, or sometimes they have the so-called, like the Book of Enoch and, you know, these so-called lost books of the Bible. One of the big red flags is that they're not consistent with Scripture. And many of them, if you want to throw in the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, the Quran, um, you know, they are either taking away or adding to, they say, oh yeah, well, Scripture forgot to put this in here, so we need to add it. The problem is that it's, those things are often inconsistent with the entirety of Scripture, and so that's, that's just a huge red flag. This doesn't fall into that category, I don't see anything, there's nothing theologically wrong with it. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Um, it does, let's see, if I bounce back to, you notice that? Did you catch that? Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Pretty close to the same verse. Not a huge difference there. So, what letter is missing? Because you guys are Hebrew experts, and my mom has the Hebrew alphabet tattooed on her left kneecap. True story. It is not a true story. The 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is none. So we have the case of the missing none. I'm sorry. There we go. Different story. Completely different. Um, so this is the letter Nun, the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and like I said, Dead Sea Scrolls is, is where it was uh, one of the documents that it's included in. This is, this is the Aleppo Codex, and that is one of the Hebrew manuscripts. It's a medieval Hebrew manuscript. Um, and you see where the, whoever this is, you can kind of see they've, colored those two letters green. Um, that is verse 13 and what we know as verse 14, and there is no 13b, there's no none <laughs> there. So that's one of the Hebrew manuscripts that does not show it. Uh, this is Psalm 145, uh, one of the fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and here we have a close-up of one of the completed, where they've kind of filled in the missing stuff on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so here you've got verse 13 right there. There's verse 14, but here's where the Dead Sea Scrolls adds, that's the nun. Um, and so they've, that they did find it there. Now, when you look at your Bibles and it talks about the Masoretic text, you see there it'll, it'll say, it's abbreviated MU, if you've ever wondered what that was. Um, that uh, Aleppo Codex that we saw is one of those groups. Out of all of those medieval Hebrew texts, only one of them includes the nun. None of the rest do. So you have a hard time using these documents to support the fact that that verse should be added. But then why would you not have, why is the nun missing? You know, it's like, wait a minute, it's an acrostic. There's 22 letters, there's only 21 verses. Why would you not include it? Well, there's a couple of possibilities um, that we can consider. One is that God wrote it and he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> Why does he have to follow any of our silly rules? Like, well, there's 22 Hebrew letters, there needs to be 22 verses. Um, and a second option is that uh, it truly is missing, and it just is one of those things that when it got copied over, it got missed, a scribal error, a mistake. Um, and Dead Sea Scrolls and some other, by the way, the, the Latin Vulgate, the Septuagint, they all include it, um, which really doesn't lend them a lot of, credi a lot of credibility, to be, to be honest. Um, 
But another option is that this is truly, it's kind of the first option, but it's truly what the Holy Spirit wanted to put down. And the psalmist, in this case, David, is using it as a really cool literary device. And by the way, I lean towards that. I lean toward the fact that David omitted that letter for a very intentional, he had an inten a, a reason for doing it. He wasn't, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't an oversight, he did it on purpose. Why on earth would he do it on purpose? Well, because David's David, and David was a genius. I mean, he was a military genius, but he was also, think of the poetry that he's written. Wow. Have you ever cried after reading any of the Psalms, or like the 23rd Psalm, or I mean, man, you just think of how much God loves you, <laughs> even when we're idiots, you know? And David knew idiot. <laughs> David, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, David knew what it meant to fall and to fail, utterly fail before God, but he also knew what God's mercy and redemption and reconciliation looked like. And then David was a, look, David was a passionate man and he had high highs and low lows. And when he crashed, he crashed. But when he rejoiced, man, did he rejoice. And so we see in Psalm 145, I think we see David recognizing how amazing God is. Look at the language. We'll back up to verses 12 and 13. To make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. What does this say about God? Pull out some words that you see up there that describe who God is or kind of, you know, you can use your own words. But what do we know about God just from these two verses? He's everlasting, right? What else? Glorious. Mighty. He's mighty. Endures. Yeah, he endures. I mean, so you, you, you just, just from those two verses, you get a, a, an idea of who God is and who David understood him to be. And so the emphasis in these verses is David's behavior or God's behavior and qualities. Well, God's, right? And then we go to verse 14. Then David shifts things. The Lord upholds all who are falling. And in the Hebrew, the word is nafal. And it means to fall, to lie, as in lying down, be cast down, to fail. And I think that's the key. Because what does David do in verses 12 and 13? He talks about how awesome and amazing God is. And then what does he do? He skips a letter in the Hebrew alphabet <laughs> because he had no word to describe how he felt about God. And it made sense for him to go from God's success and man failing. Do you get what he did there? It's a kind of a play on things because he said, all right, I failed. I forgot a letter of the alphabet. <laughs> Mankind is imperfect. God is not imperfect. And so I think David did it on purpose. I think it was his way of saying, look, God is, but I'm not. And so I'm going to leave out a letter of the alphabet. Um, and notice, again, the transition between the themes there. And, in the, and when you look at the Hebrew manuscript, again, it's another one of those, it doesn't really show here per se, because I did two separate sides, but there's a break between verse 13 and 14. God succeeds, I fail. And he changes the theme from, for the rest of the verse. Um, verse 15, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all those who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. So after David acknowledges that I'm imperfect, I am fallible, then he, he turns right back to who God is. You help those who are weak. You help those who call on, on, on you know, those who call on him, those who fear him or obedient to him. 
He hears their cry and saves them. And then he, after the end of verse 20, he, he pauses again. And then he ends it with verse 21. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So my opinion there is that it's, it's an intentional omission. And I think it really speaks to who David was as a psalmist, uh, as a poet, as a man of God, a man after God's own heart that failed, that screwed up, and yet we see that he was also passionate about getting right with the Lord. It took him time. Remember after his affair with Bathsheba and murdering, having her husband Uriah murdered, we're talking nine months to a year, somewhere around there before he gets his life right. But then we see in Psalm 51 how much he was yearning for that intimacy with God. Cast not your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He had lost that. He had lost his first love, God. And so there's also, like I said, there's no great agreement on whether that extra verse should be in there where the missing none. Um, but you can conclude whatever you'd like, but I think it's intentional. I think David was inspired by the Holy Spirit and just wanted to show in a very dramatic, powerful, passionate way was that he failed, God never would. And even when he failed, God would continue to love him, continue to show him mercy, continue to guide him each step of the way. Well, I'm done. It's seven minutes early. Are you going to be upset? You know I can talk longer. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for these amazing passages in Scripture. And thank you that we can... We can have fun a little bit in digging into them and seeing what kind of creativity there is and, and literary um, devices. But Lord, thank you that it's so much more than just a fun exercise. It's truly get, getting an idea of who you are, a better idea of who you are, your character. And the more we get to know you, then the more we know us, ourselves, really. We are created in your image. And so... We're certainly flawed, we're certainly imperfect, but we do serve a perfect God. Thank you that we can trust in you always, that we can rely in your strength, that you are everlasting, that you endure, that your mercy is, is always there and ever present. Thank you for our time tonight. Please give us continued, uh, well, give us safety as we uh, go our separate ways. And be with us this week. Help us to bring to mind the things that we know uh, about you from your word. And as we read your word this week, please give us insight. Uh, we ask that your Holy Spirit would reveal your truth to us. Um, and when we're confronted by it, that we would change our lives to pattern what you want for us, rather than try to get your word to fit what we want to do. Lord, thank you for loving us that amazing expression of love through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name we ask and pray these things. Amen.